The question I want to deal with today is, was Bismarck wrong? Who would be right if Bismarck was wrong? In this case, it would be the German general staff led by von Moltke. In the case of German imperial formation, the generals in the wars with Austria as well as the war with France wanted to take territory. The territory they wanted to take was mineral rich and strategically important. If we look at Bohemia and Moravia, I've highlighted Bohemia here, it was described as a knife blade pointed at the heart of Germany, Brandenburg. Well, if we go up, doo -doo, we're there. And this was, in fact, part of the fears around a war with Austria. Von Moltke wanted to make sure his forces could protect the frontier in case Austria decided to go make a bayonet charge, hell for leather, all through Saxony and up into Brandenburg. If he could protect against that and then use other forces to make a flanking maneuver, he would be able to save Germany from disaster. Well, Prussia from disaster. <laughs> and that after the war, certainly taking Bohemia and Moravia was of a strategic importance. Granted, there is a significant German population there, but also granted, there's an even more significant Czech population there. It would be a problem to assimilate all those. They, they already were having trouble assimilating the Poles and Slavs from centuries before, as well as the Danes in Schleswig-Holstein. Adding a bunch of Czechs to the mix is not their, not really their desire, but all the same. For, for strategic and economic purposes, taking Bohemian Moravia made sense to the general staff. Taking Austria proper, that would be Greater Austria, Styria, Tyrol, taking those areas... Those were high German concentration areas. They made sense from a romantic notion that, yes, we are trying to actually unify all of the German-speaking world and not just grab territory. But in these events, uh, Bismarck said no. Number one, you don't want to make a permanent enemy out of Austria by taking part of it. And two, you don't want to scare all of Europe by taking... Bohemia, Moravia, and Greater Austria, and then leaving the rest of the empire to fall apart. He said, this is not a good thing to ha have let happen. Just be happy with the win, consolidate the North German Federation, and let's move on. The, the hope was actually to consolidate all of Germany as a result of the, the Brothers' War. The, the North German states, that when they saw what happened to Saxony, Electoral Hess, and Hanover, that these states, Saxony and Hanover in particular, being rather large states, were just taken over by the Prussians and forcibly brought into federation with them. Well, the rest of the North German states, being smaller, said, well, we either do it with a negotiation or we lose out in a war or our people revolt and force us in. Either way, the, the best of those situations is a negotiated one. Let's negotiate. And, and they were able to negotiate and get privileges and so forth for their uh, nobilities and such. They were able to join in and take what was already there in the form of the Zolverein, where they had already got a unified economy. This just makes it even more unified. And they already were expected to have their military operate under Prussian command in the event of a war. There was some provision for other German states, but it was Prussian command. It was going to be Prussian command. So why not just get rid of the inevitable and go to the Prussian system, which they did. The southern German states, Baden, Württemberg, and Bayern, or Bavaria, they held out. Even though Baden itself was very Prussophilic in its policies, it still didn't just up and join in with the Prussians. And, and Württemberg and, and Bavaria all wanted to maintain their own national character and strengths, and they thought they could potentially win out against Prussia. They, it, they felt if Prussia invaded them, that they would fight a guerrilla war against the Prussians the way the Spanish fought against Napoleon. Now, not everybody felt that way. There, there, there are only very few fire eaters in those areas. But being unified with Prussia was not a popular idea. I've I, I had some ancestors, and I'm not alone in having ancestors, that left 
that part of the world to go somewhere that Prussia wasn't about to take over. Uh, mostly they went to the Americas, north and south, but I digress. They, let's just say that it's enough to say that there is resistance, enough resistance that they don't join with Germany in the wake of the Austro-Prussian War. And that a war with France is, in Bismarck's calculation, something that could help bring them across to see the superiority of being in a Prussian-led Germany as safety from a Napoleon-led France. And so Bismarck was able to manipulate Louis Napoleon, or Napoleon III. Napoleon III, for his part, knew that he was not a great general. No. He had the name Napoleon. He didn't have the generalship. He wanted to see himself as a statesman. So that's why he, he is always interjecting himself into political situations and diplomatic concerns. It's his vision of France acting as the fulcrum of Europe. Metternich's out of the way. Let France take over what Metternich was doing and maintain the concert of Europe and help to deliberate and all, uh, you know, all that other business there. And he had overextended France. This is by 1866, 1867, 89, into 1870. France had attempted to rule Mexico via an Austrian Habsburg monarch. That did not go well. Uh, and when that monarch, Maximilian, was uh, killed by a firing squad in Mexico, the French king, uh, or the, the emperor of France, Napoleon, went to visit the emperor of Austria to express his condolences, and the Austrian monarchy was of the opinion he wouldn't have been massacred if it wasn't for you and your meddlesome work in Mexico. You, you were at this, you, you're expressing grief over a death you caused. Hmm. They, were, he was, they were not happy to see the guy. And the French were not happy either. That had been a very costly adventure and had now become a terrible reverse for France. So Napoleon is worried about his own standing at home. It, he's constantly having plebiscites in order to, to rule. It's, it's very shaky underneath him. And Bismarck is aware of this. He knows that if he can provoke Napoleon enough, give him enough pokes, eventually he'll step off of his statesman stool, put on his military cap, and go to war. And that's where Bismarck feels that Prussia will be able to be victorious. He creates the Ems Dispatch. That's enough insult for Napoleon to get off and declare war against Prussia. Because the southern German states have treaties with Prussia that if Prussia's attacked, they got to join in, they're in as well, and the attack goes into, well, it doesn't go really that far into Germany, because the Germans take things and swing it right back, capture Louis Napoleon at the Battle of Sedan, and then lay siege to Paris, Napoleon loses his government position, it there's the Paris Commune and then the, the, the Third Republic, and it's, it's just it, it's over after that. <laughs> the, the Second Empire ends with his capture at Sedan. And in the wake of that, the, the generals that were denied parts of Austria five year, or four years earlier now are demanding a part of France, and Bismarck is unable to stop them. They choose Alsace-Lorraine. Why? Alsace-Lorraine is strategically important. It acts as a shield to, show to southern Germany, and it has a lot of mineral resources, the same as Bohemia and Moravia. What about the German-speaking population there? Hmm. There is a German-speaking population there. It's more like Swiss German, though, a lot of French in it. And Swiss German is not always intelligible to a German speaker, whether he is South German or North German, it, it's like, oh no, they're talking Swiss. <laughs> and in fact, Bismarck had said, why don't we offer Alsace-Lorraine as a buffer state to Switzerland? If, if, they're, if it's owned by the Swiss, 
the Swiss are famously neutral. No one's going to go to war there and we'll have no border between us and France. That can help keep the peace. The, and the generals were like, what, give that? To, we fought a war and then we give territory to the Swiss and the Swiss were like, oh, keep us out of this. We are really neutral. We don't want to be seen as taking territory from anybody because that's, that, that's just going to come back and bite us. No, thank you. And at the end of the day, the generals prevailed. And Alsace-Lorraine was added to the German Empire, which was declared in the Hall of Versailles. And, and Bismarck did not want that to happen either. He did not want to be building the future of Germany on the fallen body of the French nation because he knew that body would rise up again. Well, the map I have here, this is a Germany that I built in my game of Victoria 3 where I went the von Moltke plan. I took strategically important areas for their location as well as for their mineral resources. I've got Alsace-Lorraine, I've got Bohemia, I've got Moravia. Have I done the right thing? Or was Bismarck not wrong? It would seem on the surface, if all, if all we have are his public declarations, that Bismarck was actually in, in favor of taking Alsace-Lorraine. He, he actually told the Prussian ambassador in London, to say this to help fix public opinion in England. This is his statement. Uh, public opinion in England will understand that a quick repeat of the monstrous sacrifice that this war cost our people, whether they be in palaces or villages, is to be avoided if at all possible, and that we must better secure southern Germany against the danger of its open position than we have previously, where from Strasbourg, clever and energetic leadership could at any time not only... Uh, an assault not only Baden, but also Württemberg and Bavaria. Today we stand on the battlefield against the 12th or 15th War of Invasion and Conquest carried out by France against Germany within the last 200 years. In 1814 and 1815, one sought surety against a repetition of these disturbances of the peace and the mild treatment of France. The danger, however, lies in the incurable imperiousness and arrogance innate to the character of the French people, and which can be misused by every ruler of the country to attack peaceful neighbors. Our protection against this evil lies not in unfruitful attempts to momentarily mitigate for the sensitivity of the French, but rather in our gaining of well-fortified borders. Okay, I, I hammed it up, but that's how he wanted it to be read, not just flatly. There's emotional arguments in here. One, bash the French. They're imperious and arrogant. That always plays well in England, am I right? Am I right, English viewers? <laughs> you know, yeah, bash the French. Uh, two, stress that from Strasbourg, that's a little pointy bit in Alsace-Lorraine, that they can go pew, right into southern Germany. Not into Prussia, but into Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria. The other three, poor little dears. Oh. So he's setting them up. The French are the aggressors here. and They'll always be aggressors. Remember, he mentions 1814 and 1815. Remember Napoleon? Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very emotional statement. Play on those prides and fears and prejudices of the British and use that to justify how this border must be secured somehow. Even though he was against it, he, he takes what the generals were going to ask for anyway and puts uh, what he considers to be the best possible spin on that. But this was not really how Otto von Bismarck felt. Now, at the time, it, it was clear to many observers that this was a mistake. Uh, Karl Marx, he was the uh, guy that gave us Marxism. And but if you're not a Marxist, don't don't break out in highs because I'm going to quote the guy. He has some very important criticisms and observations that must be taken into account. You cannot dismiss him just because his name is Marx and he's a Marxist. Marx's theory is very important to study. Whether you agree with it or not, you must study it and respond to it intelligently in order to better understand your own position. I highly recommend reading Marx. At any rate, Marx said this about the invasion. He said, if ever there was a conqueror who took material guarantees to break the strength of a nation, it was Napoleon I through his Treaty of Tilsit and the way in which he put this into effect against Prussia and the rest of Germany. But for all that, his gigantic power broke like a rotten cane before the German people. 
what are mat the, the, what are the material guarantees that Prussia, in its wildest dreams, could or should impose on France as compared to those imposed by Napoleon I himself? This time the result will be no less ominous. History will measure its retribution not on the extension of square miles ripped from France, but from the scale of the crimes created in the by the policy of conquest in the second half of the 19th century. It's emotional as well, but it says there's going to be revenge. Just as the Germans saw this as revenge for what happened to, at the hands of Napoleon when he humiliated Prussia in 1806, the French saw this as a great humiliation and wanted to rectify that coming out of World War I, greatly humiliating the Germans, and then that led to the French humiliation in 1940, and then finally the 1945 peace that saw Germany partitioned and militarily occupied, which military occupation persists to this day. Persists to this day. Those bases are not there for decoration. <laughs> Think about that. At any rate, uh, Frederick the Great said, and this was in Frederick the Great's time, let us take most likely in reference to Silesia, which he took. Let us take. After that, we shall always find lawyers enough to defend our rights. We'll make up a story. And that's exactly what the Germans did for Alsace-Lorraine. And I wonder what story they would have made up for Bohemian Moravia, because in this scenario, they're making up that story. In the case of Alsace-Lorraine, there were already people, not just lawyers, but other propagandists, that were working on the question of what part to take of France and why. They called Alsace-Lorraine their long-lost brothers and expected there to be a liberation of the Germans there. In reality, the Prussians attacking bombarded Strasbourg deliberately, deliberately targeting civilian targets, including their cathedral, causing massive casualties among the civilians. This is not the way to greet a long-lost part of the nation with trying to crush their will to resist. <laughs> it gives the lie to the long-lost brother argument. Now, to be fair, there were mixed feelings within Alsace-Lorraine. They knew what was coming. They saw the war clouds gathering with Napoleon and Bismarck. And they knew that they were going to be the, basically the bet. The, whoever wins is going to get Alsace-Lorraine. Or really, Alsace, that Lorraine part. That was a bit of a surprise. I know we draw it as Alsace-Lorraine on the map, but the, uh, the, it's called Alsace-Lorraine because Alsace was the original group of provinces, and then the Germans took part of Lorraine. It, it, the Germans actually wanted to take all the land uh, east of the Meuse. That would be it, uh, all of Alsace-Lorraine as well as Lorraine and a good chunk of, what is this, uh, Champagne. Just take all of that. Now, that would be a heck of a map to draw. Uh, that would be all, almost as much of a grab as taking all Bohemia, Moravia, and then all of Austria proper. A huge crippling move. And a huge population that would be incredibly resistant towards that. But the, uh, they took Alsace and a part of Lorraine. And within Alsace, there were mixed feelings. There were people who thought, like, uh, because, because Napoleon was, you know, he was no great guy all the time. A lot of people in Alsace didn't like Napoleon, and they thought maybe if we had, were ruled from Berlin, we'd have more stable leadership. Also, Napoleon had closed off the borders for trade, and they thought that, you know, that had ruined their economy, the protectionism of Napoleon. So he thought, they thought, well, if we're part of Germany, we're trading along the Rhine River. That would give us more trade connections to guys who are just right across the river from us. And there's also a mineral-based economy in those mountains there. The thought being that Germany is more industrialized than France right now. They have more need of our coal and our iron. We'll get better prices for them. 
So there, there were people who were in favor of that. There are also people who are dead set against it. So let's not assume that everybody everywhere has the same feelings. I, I frequently realize that propaganda makes things a black and white issue, but history makes a gray of it all. And you've got to start sorting out your shades here and there. Now, Bismarck argued against making permanent enemies. And that did not dissuade von Moltke, who saw that this was militarily important. And once the decision was made, Otto von Bismarck decided to maintain the public front. Let's be united as we speak in public. I'm not going to undercut you. And that's why we have his particular statement to the Prussian ambassador in London. What were the justifications for taking Alsace-Lorraine? And could they have also been used for Bohemia-Moravia? One of those would be ethnology. The idea that you, you look at uh, the physical type of someone and you can determine that, boom, they, they're just like us because their skulls are a certain shape and their teeth look this way and their finger bones are this other way, just like us. Therefore, it proves that we inhabited this area since thousands of years ago. We have now got a claim on it in the 19th century. Yes, use archaeology as a justification for conquest. <laughs> but it falls apart. It falls apart. When they found so-called Germanic skulls mixed in with the so-called Celtic skulls, it just indicated that the, they're at the same strata. The, the people have been migrating in the area around the same time or moving back and forth. And for this whole ethnology thing, that people of the same physical type and who speak the same language, they should form the same nation. Well, then why wasn't Belgium part of France? Oh, well, because we didn't want France to be so strong in the Congress of Vienna, so we took part of it. Oh, I see where you're going with that. And what about Switzerland? Oh, what about Switzerland? Well, Switzerland's got Germans, French, Italians, Romanche, and they're all in the same nation. Oh. Well, the Swiss, they're crazy. Nobody else does it like that. Well, I know another nation, oh, that combines Danes, Slavs, Poles, oh, what's well, and Germans. How dare they? How, where is this nation? Prussia shall conquer it and, 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 and free the Germans. Well, except that nation is Prussia. Oh, yeah, you, you took parts of other countries and added them to yours, the ethnological argument would mean that you've got to give those bits back. Prussia shall be... Uh, uh, I, I, no! Poland shall be kept off the map! Uh. Yeah, right, because it suits your aggrandizement, Prussia. The ethnologic argument is a very convenient one and is very con easily discarded. It falls flat. What about the linguistic argument? They speak German in Alsace. We must unite the German people. Well, why didn't you unite the Germans in Austria? That was politically difficult. Next question. What about the, uh, the parts of Lorraine that are French-speaking, like the city of Metz? They speak a lot of French there. Um, um, <laughs> got nothing for that. Yeah, you don't. And by the same note, you can make the same ethnologic argument for Bohemian Moravia. There were Germans there. Look at their skull types. And there's also Slavs there. Look at their skull types. What about the linguistics? They speak German in Bohemia and they speak Czech. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, what about geography? Yes, geography. The Vos... The, the, I'm going to mess this up. I, I can't do French very well. V-O-S-G-E-S. The Vosges, I'm going to say it, but I know it's something like Vosges or Vosges. I don't know. I can't pronounce it. Those mountains there in Alsace were a natural border for Germany. What about the Rhine being a natural border? No, 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 no. That, that, that's a terrible natural border because we want the stuff that's in Rhineland. The, 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 those mountains in Alsace, those are the natural borders so that way you can get them and hold on to them. Yes, yes. I mean, no, wait. <laughs> If France had won the, 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 the Franco-Prussian War, then we'd be talking about how they took over the, this North Rhine and Rhineland province. Alsace-Lorraine would still be here, and then the full side, you know, that, that whole right bank of the Rhine River 
or sorry, the full left bank of the Rhine River would be on the, on you know, marked as blue on the French map there. And we'd be talking about, was Louis Napoleon right to take all that territory and create a permanent enemy in Prussia, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and, and think of also how the people in that area felt. Some of them were actually pro-French. They did not like Prussia. They thought if we were lo- ruled by Louis Napoleon, he's more liberal, more... Uh, He's more foresighted in domestic policy. We'd like that better than what the Prussians are cooking up, which seems to be very authoritarian. Not everybody was like that, but like I said, lots of gray. Just as you have people in Alsace-Lorraine that are either for or against Germany, you have people who are for or against France in Rhineland. In different proportions, it's not just one-to-one. There's, there's, a, there's a lot more complexity there. But, yes, the, the whole natural border thing you know, like, where's the natural border of Germany when it gets to Russia? Is it the the Vistula? Is it the Dnieper? Is it the Volga? <laughs> well, now that you mention that, okay, hold on there. Uh, the whole idea of natural borders is just being able to say, we, we, we'd like to own all the territory, and here's a convenient line of terrain that allows us to justify grabbing it. To say for the French that the Rhine is the natural border would also give them Belgium, and chunk of southern Netherland. For the Germans to say these particular mountains are a natural border, mm. in the case of Bohemian Moravia, you could argue that the, the mountains that had the highest concentration of German speakers would be a natural border, but not the whole of the province. And if you don't take the whole of the province, then you create other political issues and geographic issues that because the whole of the province was supposed to be kept together as part of the deal that gave Bohemia to Hungary and that the King of Austria inherited when the King of Hungary died and that you can't just scribble over the borders any old way you want, except that's what they did in Schleswig-Holstein. But <sighs> anyway, the, it was argued that this was a natural border, but since they took part of Lorraine that's that was beyond that border, it gives the lie there. Just as taking Bohemia and Moravia, you're, you're taking farmland that's not natural border. You're taking it because there's a, a large population and great agricultural wealth there. Okay, historical rights. Well, historically, Alsace and Lorraine were both parts of the Holy Roman Empire. And that was German, right? <laughs> no. It had a lot of Germany in it, but if you're going to use a Holy Roman Empire argument, again, you're going to get a lot of Austria, you're going to get Belgium, you're going to get the Netherlands, you're going to not have Schleswig, but you do get Holstein. Uh, it, if you wanted to use the Holy Roman Empire, you just made things a lot more complicated for yourself, Prussia. No. There are plenty of historical gymnastics that were created in Germany to justify the historical justification for taking Alsace-Lorraine, and these were every bit as complicated as the ones that they swept aside in the Schleswig-Holstein question. Oh, that's nonsense. That's a bunch of medieval claptrap and jibber-jabber. Schleswig and Holstein should be brought into Germany. That's right. But then medieval claptrap and all that, well, you need the jibber-jabber to justify Alsace-Lorraine, so we'll use it there. Uh, They they could make claptrap and jibber-jabber for taking over... uh, Bohemian Moravia. Uh, look, we're, we're only joining it to Silesia, which was historically part of the uh, Cisleithene nation there. So there you go. We're putting it all back together under, uh, but they're under the, the the Prussian crown, not the Austrian crown. There's a, yeah. So the historical rights are not really going to stand up. The key is, the, this is where a case where the victors get to draw the map. And honestly, the choice was between mutilation of France, losing that little bit there, or annihilation. These were peace negotiations to get the Germans out of France. France was in dire situation in 1870 and 1871. The Paris Commune, There's they've lost the imperial monarchy, and they're building up a, th- a third republic. It's in chaos. It's in disorder. They need... A breathing space and if they can get the German army out then they can deal with themselves internally if they don't get the German army out then the Germans are likely to take much more and say well fine then 
you know, if you're not going to negotiate with us, our generals are wanting to take everything up to Paris almost and call it a day. <sighs> so let, let the Germans mutilate a part of France and we'll live to fight another day. That's the thought. So how did the people in Alsace and Lorraine feel? Well, we mentioned mixed feelings, but they were more mixed in favor of France, or at least Alsace, but not Germany. We have this from uh, February 17th, 1871. There were representatives from Alsace and Lorraine uh, at the National Assembly at Bordeaux, because they can't meet in Paris right now, so they're in Bordeaux. And these guys affirmed the immutable will of Alsace and Lorraine to remain French. They said that the settlement was a legitimate and permanent provocation to war. And they said, we hold to be null and void every act and treaty, vote or plebiscite, which would consent to the abandonment in favor of the foreigner of all or of any part of our provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. And a few weeks later, they reiterated, we declare once more null and void a compact which disposes of us without our consent. So, doesn't sound like, hey guys, we're cool with the German thing. No, <laughs> please don't send us away, we protest. And, but they knew they had to go. They, they, they saw that happening. The victors, in this case, the Germans, they, if you look at the general staff, they have their reasons for taking over Alsace-Lorraine and it, it's quite straightforward. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, General Heinrich von uh, Twitschke put it bluntly. He said, even if the Alsatians had been Japanese, Germany would have annexed them to capitalize on the military value of Metz and Strasbourg. like yeah if they had been japanese whatever we're taking it that's land we are going to take uh general gustav von alvensleben also he, he's he's the one that was saying let's take yeah alsace lorraine wh wh why why make a special little province of it why don't we just take all of everything up to the marne river uh did i say muse earlier i meant marne if i said marne then i keep it on marne anyway that would have been uh, a huge portion of, of French territory there. And I don't think that it would have gone well if they had done that, because certainly what we see having happened in Alsace and what would have likely happened in Bohemia and Moravia with a Czech population there is a, a general Germanization policy this is not a kind move of a long-lost brother. This is, we're going to make you Germans. And there was already Germanization policy going on in uh, the German-occupied parts of Poland, uh, around Posen and West Prussia. Forcing the language to be spoken, forcing certain things on the curriculum, things of that sort. They changed the name of Alsace-Lorraine to alsace lothringen changed all the signs into German, they had to make it German out of military necessity. And the same thing would have happened in, 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 in this scenario in Bohemian Moravia. It has to become German out of military necessity because if it's a rebellious province on the border, an enemy could take advantage of that. To the point where in Alsace, they ordered teachers to you know, you know, do instruction in German. French language was limited. That Charlemagne... That's a French word, meaning Charles the Great, or Charles Magnus. Uh, Charlemagne had to become Carl de Grosse. <laughs> the, oh, wow, he's going from French to German. Yes, he was a German king, not a French one, a German one. That's because he founded the Holy Roman Empire, which is Germany, see? Many emigrators, or sorry, emigrators, <laughs> many administrators and teachers emigrated. I guess they became emigrators. Uh, they didn't want to go along with the German version of things. And the Germans had to find ways to get people to administer and school in the province there. Many young men in Alsace-Lorraine refused to report for duty in the German army and instead escaped and reported into the French Foreign Legion. Uh, 
and but you think, well, maybe this would have worked over time. Because I, I can see the same thing happening in the Czech in the Czech areas there. If Germany occupies them, they're outraged, they're upset, they will find a way out and join the army of somebody else. Probably not Russia, probably not Austria either, but French Foreign Legion. There would be a Czech brigade in there had this been the map drawn. What about 40 years later? We'll say 42 years later. The year is 1913. Has Alsace-Lorraine been Germanified or Germanized? Well, we have the incidents in the village of Saverne, or the Germans call it Zabern. But anyway, in, in, in Saverne, there, were, uh, there was this lieutenant who was saying like, you know, he wanted to have an armed guard with bayonets to go again to defend him against any Alsatian that tried to stop him from buying chocolates. Well, he got overheard saying that. And the people were just laughing at him as he's walking around the village with these four guys with bayonets going, oh my gosh, <laughs> this, this guy, this guy. <laughs> and the laughter became a problem for the Germans. And they start arresting people for laughing. Like, what are you doing? Huh? What? Huh? <laughs> what? You are laughing! You are laughing! Ah, to jail, Mitsu! And <laughs> get the, get the... it got to the point where after a few months of this, there was this officer, same officer, he was walking down the street and this cobbler who was crippled, just like someone, this guy, you know, he started laughing. And in a rage, the officer ordered some soldiers to hold the cobbler still while he lashed him across the forehead with his saber. I mean, for laughing. I would teach him a lesson. This is the stuff that this makes people madder and madder and madder, or at least, at the very least, less likely to stop laughing at your ridiculous behavior. The guy, the, the, the officer faced a court-martial over his behavior, and the court-martial came down in favor of the officer. They held that he he acted in self-defense because the cobbler, the, the shoemaker, who was crippled, couldn't walk, had a pocket knife in his pocket. You know, the place where people keep pocket knives, the pocket, that was it was there, not in his hands. It was in his pocket, but that was his self-defense. And that's why two soldiers had to hold him down while he gets gashed across the forehead. And this is 1913. 42 years later. And this it, it's likely that the cobbler spent all of his adult life, if not his entire life, as a German citizen. And he's being treated in this way. I don't think so. It, it would have led to even more trouble for Germany to take in the Czechs. Now... Was Bismarck right that Germany should not have taken any territory? The, German, the, the, the generals agreed with him in the case of uh, Bohemia and Moravia. They disagreed and had their way, but perhaps because of Bismarck's opposition, they didn't take everything that they wanted to take in France. They only took Alsace and a part of Lorraine. So was Bismarck right that that was not the way to go? Well, we know for a fact that Austria eventually made friendship with the Germans and had an alliance with them. If Germany had not taken Alsace and Lorraine, then Napoleon was already wobbly enough. He was already done as a leader after the Battle of Sedan. If the Germans had left and just said, we're, we're done here. Yes, we fought a war and we took your emperor. You're welcome. You know, <laughs> Bye. There would be some ill will, like, oh, those Germans, man, they, they, they tricked us into fighting and some mistrust. But eventually, they could have come back to peace. The, the, there was the Third Republic that came by. They, they were more liberal-minded and more open to the idea of trade and perhaps would have been willing to establish bonds of commerce with the Germans and not seeking revenge for the loss of their territory to the point where they would form alliances with other powers just to get back at Germany. 
if the, if the if the French spirit of revenge had not been there, would we have even had the entangling system of alliances that led to World War One? I'm not saying that global conflict would have been impossible, but maybe it would not have been as brutal. Maybe it would not have been as horrific that it could have been contained because the Crimean War almost became a global conflict. Uh, the United States almost came in on the side of Russia, but it had been diplomatically contained and things had been able to be sorted out because nobody was hell-bent on revenge for anything. It was just, they're just thinking about stuff. So to further answer this question, was Bismarck wrong or was he right? We need to find out if I was right or wrong in taking these areas. Do I continue to have a German empire later in the game? Let's take a look. To be fair, I've had a few other wars and I took a little bit more of France because I figured, ah, get it to them. And I was able to bring Sweden in as a protectorate because Norway kept rebelling and I used obligations and peace deals to make Sweden part of Germany there, or, you know, a, a dominion. And yes, we had a big war with Austria and got to the point where I said, that's it, that's it, smash them down, break them up, and when Austria's small enough, we'll win them over diplomatically. But there are uh, three words over the German territory when previously there had been two. German Empire was there before, and or it could have been Empire of Germany, whatever, but now it's Republic of Germany. And the flag that's up there is not the tricolor of the Imperial Germany, that's the tricolor of the liberal movement of Frankfurt. In essence, the unrest that my people had because of you know trying to take in all the Czechs and the French and the Danes and the Poles were still upset about a lot of things. Don't blame them. Uh, all that unrest contributed to political movements that transformed Germany to where it lost the monarchy and gained a Republican form of government. And it's 1886. This German Empire lasted from 1855 in the game to 18, 1886, so that would be 31 years. Mm. How long did Bismarck's thing go? Well, he started in 1871, and it went to 1918, so that's 47, right? Yeah, that's that's a little bit that's longer than what I had. <laughs> but then that asks the question also. The, the empire that Bismarck wanted to create, was it actually a doable thing in the world of the late 19th century? Were things in Europe going so... The pressures socially were for nations to, yes, form on linguistic lines. That's why we have, I've got Hungary and Galicia and all these other groups there, but but also to be along liberal lines where people vote for their leadership. And although it's the United Kingdom, the, the king and queen are not running the government. It's the prime minister. But the idea of republicanism, the, the French Revolution that started you know, in the late 1700s, it's coming to fruition even though it's not being imposed as a direct result of French revolutionary activity, the seeds of those revolution and the ideas of that revolution live on to where the, the various nations become less autocratic and more democratic. I've got this republic here. Uh, if I look at the interest groups in power, I see the industrialists, petite bourgeoisie, trade unions, intelligentsia, armed forces. I do not see the ones that were strongest at the beginning of the game, the Junkers und the Evangelical Church. They're out, and the people are in. And the trade unions are 15% of the interest group there. This is a very strong movement here. Intelligentsia, 14%. Uh, Germany is much more liberal than it was before. And even though Bismarck himself tried to give 
some concessions in order to forestall a full-blown liberal revolution, he could not do so. After the complete failure of the First World War, the German people rose up and abolished their monarchy and created a republic. And I've got the same thing here. But I didn't even lose a war. It was just that the, the pressure became so huge. I was getting, it was either a, revo, a, it was either a revolution or push this bill through Parliament. And I was worried that I would have a counter-revolution, but the, the other forces that were opposed to it were so weakened that they, they couldn't muster anything. So many other liberal reforms had been passed that their power was undermined, and the bill to create a presidential republic went through. It could be that I was wrong in thinking that I was going to be able to keep a Germany together and rule it. As, I, I really had a goal in this game to play Germany as an empire all the way to 1936. Did not happen. I have failed there. If I had tried to hold it together, it would have been a revolution and it would have been a revolution that I would have lost. By the same notion, Bismarck wanted to maintain a German empire that would go beyond not just Wilhelm I, but Wilhelm II and, and so forth, that it would remain a steady thing in politics, that there could be a, a, an imperial regime in Europe that would maintain itself. But in the wake of World War I, that, that proved impossible. The emperors of Russia, Austria, Germany, Turkey, all of them exited the stage of history, never to return, except in Hearts of Iron 4 mods <laughs> and focus trees. But here, I've, I've lost my goal, and I think Bismarck lost his goal as well. Even if the French had not been made a permanent enemy, would the monarchy of Prussia have remained? I don't think so. I don't think so. Even if there had not been a First World War, the liberal pressures would have forced them to step aside and either allow for a British-style system where they are a very noticeable head of state, but not head of government, or a French one where there's just no monarchy at all. One of those would have happened, and probably by the 20s or 30s, if not earlier. I think Bismarck and I were both wrong, trying to preserve an imperial Germany over the voice of the people. It just can't be done. It just can't be done. I hope you enjoyed this. Of course, someone's going to say it can be done. I invite the comments below. I'd love to see it if you've got tricks or tips. And I hope you've enjoyed the history and the exploration of what I see to be the folly of conquering other countries it's just going to make things more miserable. And why I really look forward to the 1.7 DLC that will allow us to not have to conquer other countries, but still economically exploit them. Yes, economic exploitation without conquest. Let's hear more of that. <laughs> because that is what the game's about, right? Right? Am I right? I hope all your diplomatic plays go the way you want them to. And we'll see you on the next video.